to be a verse. <coughs> Verse 11 is our verse in John 21. Simon Peter went out and drew the net and landed full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. It's a, it's a great principle. I, I want you to think about just uh, this week we, and I, this is the reason I'm sharing with you, uh, this week we start <coughs> A week where we have very beautiful weeks as a church. We have midweek services, we have prayer, we have Bible college. Some of you go on outreach, and it's an awesome thing. Um, it's like the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, that's what they did. People got saved, they got baptized. The Bible says they met devoutly, they met regularly. For apostolic teaching and prayer. They met many times for prayer. Day by day, they were growing. And the Lord it was adding to the number. Uh, it's an early church life. It's something supernatural. And sometimes in our hearts, we wonder about the supernatural life that God wants to give us. Because God really has called us, and this is important for us as Christians, to think like this, that God has really called us to a supernatural life and not a natural life. In the Bible, there is two Greek words for life in the New Testament. One of them is a word that means normal life, natural life. It's the life we had when we were unsaved people. It's the cares of this world life. The Greek word for it is bios, and it means biological life. We exist on the earth, we live, we drink, we go to work, we travel, we get our job. There's nothing, nothing about that life that necessarily is spiritual, it's just we do. <coughs> Jesus actually talked about that life. He said, uh, actually John said, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the pride of this life. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 4, he said, No soldier who is no Christian entangles himself with the affairs of Bayas life. Little, little challenge there. We don't entangle ourselves with too much with the effects of just the Bayas life. It's something that God wants higher for us. Can you picture what I'm saying? He wants to take us higher. And if we sacrifice and we walk, this first Peter 4 2 talks about his life, as we walk to the past life that we had, we did what we wanted to do. But today we do the will of God. There's a second word for life, and it's a beautiful word, we know it. We've heard about it many times. Zoe. Zoe means the supernatural, abundant life of God. In him was life, Zoe, and this life was the light of all men, was John 1, 4. I have come that you might have Zoe, in life more abundantly. The words that I speak to you, John 6, 63, they are spirit and they are life. Your flesh profits nothing. And many Christians live a life that's without the cross, and they, they have a natural life without the cross. But to have a supernatural life, I need to go through the cross. Amen? You understand? If anyone wants to follow me, my disciple, he must deny himself his natural life in a sense. And this is just thinking about something deeper for this week, so we are challenged and stood up. Uh, he must deny himself and then take up his cross deny himself, take up the cross which is the will of God which God has set before me and follow after me. If you preserve your natural life, you lose it. If you lose your life for his sake, you find a higher life. <coughs> the second thing I want to speak about that a Christian really needs, and this is really important, is we start Bible school. It's called a spiritual capacity. A spiritual capacity to really learn to enjoy God's life. 
you know, for a lot of Christians, it's like they hear the Bible, and it's like, okay, I heard the Bible. It was a good message. And they walk away, and they go out of church. And within a few minutes, they've forgotten everything that the Lord even spoke to them. How sad. God spoke to the Israel people in Jeremiah 2.13. This is what he said. He said, my people have committed two sins against me. My people, Israel, two sins. Number one, they have forsaken the fountain of living water. We heard last week, our beautiful message is still in my heart. Jesus Christ is at the Feast of Tabernacles and on the eighth day when they had this beautiful <coughs> feast of the Tabernacles speaking of the millennial reign of Christ when the Holy Spirit will come in fullness. The, the Jews understood it. Seven days, I've never heard it that way. Seven days, not a sound in the temple. No one could speak. And on the eighth day, Jesus stands up. Can you picture what it must have been like? Crowds of the Jews outside in the court of men, Israel, the priests, everybody. And there's a one voice that stands up and says, If any man thirsts, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me. You have forsaken the fountain of living water in Israel. If you were thirsty, you would come to me, and I will give him. As he spoke of the Holy Spirit. You've committed two sins against me. One is you've forsaken me. You've walked away from me. And the second is you've carved out for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is a problem for Christians. We spoke about it once before in the illustration. I have a calm. That's my capacity. Capacity to know God. I can have a small cup, a little little thing like a cough syrup measuring thing. Some Christians just like that. I just have enough God, enough of God to make me okay. Or I could have a cup, or I could have a bathtub, or I could have everything. How much do you want? How much do you want of God? A little. The problem is that it's a cup with really a broken cup. If you ever pour water into a broken cup, just pour it out and it just comes out. It's like the bathroom sink. You put the tap on and the water's just going down. Nothing remains. You go to service and service and service for years. Because the key between hearing and doing is capacity. When I meditate on the Word, the milk of the Word is churned in my heart. It's applied to the bread of daily life and it becomes the butter for me. And to, to enjoy my walk with Jesus Christ is awesome. And here, here it is. And we have an amazing, beautiful privilege. It says of Mary when she heard the word of God. Two Marys were spoken of in the New Testament. The first was the mother of Jesus. It says, when the angel Gabriel came to him and said, Mary, this is going to happen to you. You're going to conceive in your womb and bear a child. She said, how can it be? I'm a virgin. And the angel said, for no rima, no word that God has spoken, not nothing, but no what? In the original Greek, no rima that God has spoken is without power. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the rimas of God. And, and this is basically what it's saying here. And, and Mary, Mary said, be it done to me according to thy word. And she had a capacity. The few verses later, the shepherds say something to Mary. A few verses later, Jesus says something to Mary at 30 years old. And in Luke 2.19 and Luke 2.51, and this is what it says about Mary. It says that Mary treasured these words. In our heart. The word in the Greek means stored them. She treasured them. Is that my attitude? 
the Lord is speaking to me. And I treasure that. Diatero, terio, terio. It means to God. I hear the Bible, and the Bible's not something just by the wayside. The Bible is life to me, and I'm listening to the Word, and the Lord has spoken to me in a message, and I treasure that message, and I hold it in my heart. I want to give you just a few things we'll study tonight a little bit. Uh, seven scriptural synonyms for capacity. They're very good. Listen to them. They're beautiful. What do I need a capacity for? What do I need a capacity for? And by the way, this is the noble Christian life. People will say, this is crazy. You go to church. You go to Bible school. You're in prayer. You, you do this. You do that. You go out. You serve the Lord. I have a life that's higher, more wonderful, and more powerful than anything you can have on this earth. I remember sitting on in church and Dr. Stephen was preaching. And we'd go in the morning to church and we'd go back at the night in church. We'd go out on Monday to Bible school. We'd go back on Tuesday to Bible school. We'd go back on Wednesday night at midweek service. We didn't think about it. What do we do? Oh, yeah, let's go to the house of God. Let's have fellowship. Let's have fun. Let's have prayer. Serving the Lord is fun. People just don't understand it. They serve the devil and wonder why they don't have a good time. We have an amazing time. When you really know what you are protected from, the stress, and we have joy and prayer, what a beautiful thing. Capacity. Seven things that God speaks about capacity. Think of capacity as a cup as something that holds something. Listen to this. The first thing, thing I need capacity for is the love of God. Listen carefully. I need a capacity to receive the love of God. I need to be built up before I can serve the Lord. In Psalm 23 verse 5, the cup speaks of capacity to receive God's love. David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He prepares a table for me in the midst of my enemies. My cup runneth over. Oh, I like that. My cup run it over. Here, here's the background to this. It's beautiful. In ancient days, if you went down to a very gracious host home, let's say a king, and he had a big banquet for you, the king would tell his subjects, the people that were invited to the banquet, that he loved them. He wanted their company. And one of the ways he did it, he told his waiters, make sure that they're happy. Make sure that the cup is always full. <coughs> and so the waiters would go to the banquet table and they would make sure the fruit of the wine was poured into the cup. And the cup was, the cup didn't just fill to the end, they overflowed the cup. It was a way of saying, come friends, stay with me, I enjoy your company. But when it became 12 o'clock in the night and the host decided it was time now for everyone to go back, they didn't fill the cup. It was a sign to say, time to go now, guys. David said, when God calls me to his table, his cup never is how full. Because he always wants me there. I need to know how much God loves me. I need to realize I have the capacity to receive that love in my heart. I need the capacity for that. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, there was a lampstand. And I need capacity for the work of God. But the work of God cannot be done by natural flesh. It's not an illumination of the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah chapter 4, we have Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is a civil leader. He's brought the Jews back with Joshua, the high priest, to rebuild the temple. And they're a little struggling. It's kind of a difficult time. They're struggling to build the temple. They just need encouragement. And in Zechariah chapter 4, the angel of the Lord comes and gives Zerubbabel a vision. And in that vision, he sees a beautiful golden lampstand, seven-pronged lampstand, which we know spoke of Israel in the Old Testament, uh, the beautiful lampstand. But he saw the lampstand, and the lampstand had oil that was fed to the wicks of the lampstand by two pipes. And the two pipes were placed in bowls, golden bowls, that were filled with olive oil. 
in that vision, God told Zerubbabel, that's basically how you serve me. Not by my, not by power, but by my spirit. I need a capacity through the illumination of the Holy Spirit in my life. In 2 Kings chapter 3, we have a story of the battle going on. And Moabites come to attack Israel. And on one side, here is Israel. And King Jehoshaphat comes and he says, he says, we need to get Elisha, the prophet, to tell us what to do. We need a divine strategy. And we know what happened. Elisha came. And Elisha had an amazing, very interesting strategy. The Moabites are coming to attack. And Elijah says this. He says, listen, I want you to do this. He says, I want you to dig trenches. I want you to dig ditches in the valley. So they dug ditches in the valley. He says, I want you to fill those ditches with water. You know, the battle was won. Next morning, the sunlight came. But whatever God did, it looked like blood red and won the battle. Digging ditches in the classroom. Pastor Stevens preached a message once, and he said, "You know what, young students?" He preached it once in a grad. It was a it was a beginning of semester class, and I, I, I never heard the message, but I, I heard excerpts from the message. And this is what he said in the message. You should hear about it. He said, "In life, if you're going to do anything with God, you need to develop your capacity." And he said, "One thing is beautiful: in the classrooms of life, you will have battles." You will have trials. They will come against you. And he says, you know what you do? Instead of running away from Bible school and running away from God and saying, ah, the trials are too much for me, you dig, dig capacity. You dig ditches in the classroom and you say, God, here I am. I'm here at the beginning of the semester. And by the grace of God, I'm going to be here at the end. I'm going to develop my capacity for you. And I'm going to win battles because you know what? The more... The more you have, the more battles you will ever have in the future. Amen? Amen. 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 Capacity to have the water of the word in the valley of trials. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we have the capacity for body life. Do you know that you need capacity? Do you know that God doesn't want your little clicks? Do you know God doesn't want that? He doesn't want people to have little people so that no one can spend time with someone. Young, a woman. She was a Shunammite woman. She had a little oil. She thought she had nothing. She brought that oil to Elisha, and Elisha showed her how much she had. You know how? To the fellowship of God. He said, just go and find other vessels. And the oil didn't stop. She poured out, and she poured out, and she poured out, and she poured out, and she poured out. You know what? She found out what she couldn't have an individual victory she could have in the life of the Lord in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sisters is the sixth one. Capacity for God in his life. Not a broken sister. Here's, here's the, here, that's the fifth one. The sixth one is beautiful. I have a capacity for grace. The finished work. I need to know God through grace, not legalism. Amen? Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, He said, you can't put new wine in old wineskin. Ha! Hello? Do you understand what he's saying? Because Alan Phoenix is not here. Did you understand? Did you get it? <laughs> you can't put old wine in new. You can't put new wine in old wine skin. You can't put the teaching of the grace of God in legalism. You need to have the capacity to know God through grace, to know Him as the God of all grace, to love Him, to respond to that amazing grace. I need a capacity out of my legalistic constructs. Capacity. The net. John twenty 
anymore. They went out fishing. You see, John 21, they have forsaken the living water. You know what happens when you forsake the living water? The man speaks of capacity, it was empty. They call nothing. But then they heard the voice of Jesus Christ. That's exactly how it is. When I don't put God first and I don't have capacity, I go out fishing, I go out fishing, I go out fishing, I go back to my job, I go back to my career, I go back. Nothing's wrong with the job, and nothing's wrong with the career. We all know that we've got the balance, we put the food on our table, we need it. But you know what? If I've got to give my family something, I've got to give them something far more than my last life. Amen? I've got to give them something spiritual, something I've got from God. Something living, something powerful, something unbelievably awesome, something out of this world that I can give them. They caught nothing, but when they went and Jesus came and they drowned again, he said, Turn and put the fishing net on this side. And they did. They listened to the word. They listened to the word. They put the net, they caught fish. And the net wasn't broken. This is when we serve the Lord and we go out out of love. And they are reaching people for Jesus Christ. And I think that's what they would understand. I didn't call you to be just catching fish. I've called you to be catching man. And we go out and it's not it's not a burden. The man is not broken. We're not strained and stressed and exhausted. Keeping the schedule. You know why? We have a supernatural God. that feeds us through a supernatural word in a supernatural body. It gives us a divine schedule to supernatural life. That's what I want. And really, once you've tasted it, once you've tasted that life, you wouldn't want to settle for anything else. spiritual life. It's not about just a, a class here. I could go to a whole thing. I could go all over. I can take the whole package. People say you're foolish. You say, yes, I'm foolish, but I'm foolish for God. Whose fool are you? 